Hold on. That's all right. You can step from here. All right. Just wait a little. Okay. So, I can Deutsch, also, wenn es Fragen gibt, und ihr wisst nicht, wie man das auf Englisch sagt, gerne auch auf Deutsch. Später, wenn ich Zeit habe. So. Um, I'm Marco, this is my button name on the internet. Um, if you see this name, you can start running. <laughs> Especially if it's a code review. Uh, uh, I'm a consultant. Which means that basically I uh, get the clients, get paid a lot to tell them what to do, and then I spend all the money to go to conferences to get more clients. So, your potential clients, come talk to me. That's it. Today we're talking about event sourcing, specifically event sourcing, the good, the bad, and the complicated. The complicated, all right. Because everyone is talking about event sourcing, but is not really tackling the fact that there's a lot of complexity coming from it. Um, let's put it in context. I have a project that I'm working on, which sadly isn't live yet, because legal reasons. Uh, it's called codereviews.io. If you go there, you get a nice 503 page, which is good. Um, but um, let me put it in context. This is not about a product pitch. It's about why I picked this particular technology stack for my own stuff and for a lot of client work on the way. So the plan initially is if you have a software project, then the point is probably to make some money. If you're not making money and you're not helping somebody while doing software, then what the hell are you even doing? Okay. If it's open source, yes, I understand. You probably are sick and you need some time alone in the evening and you need to write some code for which everyone will hate you. Um, but generally, it's about money. So what happens? The idea that we had is following. You, you all know code reviews. You all know maybe GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab and stuff like that. Somebody sends us some code. We get this code. We evaluate how big this code is. Um, and we tell you well, it's going to cost you 200 bucks, 300 bucks, a million bucks. If it's pounds, then it doesn't matter because it's probably just euro cent. Um, then the client gives us their credit card. You know, we just copy it. Save it somewhere. No, don't don't save credit cards, please. Um, they basically gave us their credit card information. We block some money on it. Then the review goes on a public marketplace. Okay, so it's listed. Somebody can go in, click, and say, "I want to review this." So people apply and say, "I want to review this." So then, at the end of the day, you have a hundred people that say, "I can review this. I can help with this." Then the owner of the code goes in and says, OK, I like this person. I know this individual. He is going to review my code. Then effectively, we're going to create an environment where the review happens. So it's like a pull request. You go in, put the comments, say, this is a not go. This is no go. This is no go. This is OK. This is nice. Put some positivity in reviews. It's not all about negativity. That's my part. OK. Um, work happens. And then effectively, when the work is done, when the review is finished, the payment goes through, so the person is paid, and we get a share of the money, which is the point of doing this. So we get some of the money. The point of this is that, as you can see, this domain has a lot of interactions that are in chronological order. They depend on each other. This is what we call a process-oriented application. So we have a process, step by step. This happens, that happens, and so on and so forth. This is what you want to look at when thinking about the patterns that we will see in a bit. So the other thing that can happen here is that a lot of stuff can go wrong during this system, this, this workflow. Because you know, like people can be unhappy with what we provided as a price and say, no, I don't want to pay that, so I'm going to just bail out. People may be um, not happy with the people that decided to apply. So I don't know these people, I don't trust any of those, and 50 of those are bots, which happens a lot. Um, maybe they're unhappy with the work that was done, so maybe somebody did a code review, and the only thing they did is just providing code-style comments. Don't do that. There's automated tools for that. 
Um, the other stuff that can go wrong is that we are using external tools. When you communicate with external systems and you do not own the state of the external information, you are going to run into problems. So, for example, we are contacting GitHub. GitHub gives us the code that we want to review. So we have to download the code and do some analysis and stuff. And as you know, when GitHub goes offline, everyone takes a coffee break. Yeah. Um, or maybe goes on vacation, depends on the amount of time it's down. But anyway, the point is we, are, we have to deal with these failures. Um, we have to contact Fabricator, which is going to be an internal tool, but still, it is an external system. It can fail, it can crash, it can be misconfigured, the servers can go down. Uh, we have Bitbucket. Bitbucket is so slow that you will probably have timeouts all the time. GitLab works, doesn't, sometimes works. Uh, Stripe, if this fails, we're running out of money. There's not going to have to be a payment, which is a problem, so you want to be sure that things go through here, and then you have notifications like emails, web sockets, and so on. You want to send transactional emails. Anybody using Mailgun, right? That also goes offline a couple times a week. You can't do much about it because people send massive amounts of emails and their infrastructure just can't handle it immediately. Um, so effectively, this doesn't look good. If you were a single solo developer doing this, fine for a weekend project, but as soon as money is involved, uh, people become sharks. Like, where is my money? Once you paid, you really want to see the service um, going through. Otherwise, you're going to be an angry customer, and angry customers leave bad reviews, and bad reviews will bring down your product, and so on and so forth. So, a lot of stuff can go wrong. It doesn't look good. Um, so I worked, and I keep working on this and other project in this way, but um, with my apprentice, um, who is now in Amsterdam, Malukenio, um, and we thought, okay, we can do this anyway. We can, uh, we can try and go through this, because we analyzed these nice patterns, which are secure as an event sourcing, and we can implement this stuff in such a way that we don't go crazy. And we don't, know, uh, we don't need an entire DevOps team to handle this stuff and to keep it running. So let's go back a second and look at the traditional application. What happens in a traditional application is generally something like this. You have a, a start of a business transaction. So somebody shows at the door, you know, they send you an HTTP request, and they go through your service layer. Um, you know, then you execute some business logic. That's actual business happening there, serious business. Um, then what happens in, in an application generally is that some ORM is going to compute some changes. You don't see what is going on, but this happens under the hood somewhere, um, which makes it kind of hard to understand what is happening. And then the ORM throws the changes at your database, and at the end of everything, you have the final state, which is persisted. <laughs> um, so there are some problems here. Who are these people? Why are they there? What was their intent? Why did they start this transaction? Um, why did it end this way? Who died first? Um, so many questions. We just know what was at the beginning. We just know what was at the end. We don't know what happened. We don't know the why. Um, so, what I like about the event sourcing approach is that it kind of fixes this stuff. So, who here can say that they know event sourcing? That's a lot of people. Who uses event sourcing? Okay, who can teach event sourcing? Okay, yes. All right, All right. that was the expected response though. Okay, so, event sourcing pretty much saves facts. Things that happened in the past. That's what event sourcing is about. And this is very important when dealing with domains where um, not just it is complicated to understand what is happening, but also it is legally required to understand what is happening. So you want to have a log of everything that happened, understand it, and be able to react to things that happen. So, the point is, shit happens in the real world. One good example is things that you didn't model against. 
You know, things happen in the real world, you get notified that you now have to, to pay this amount of money, you never planned it, so you now have to add this payment to your bank account, and your bank account goes red now, and you have to deal with that, and you have to adjust to it. So shit happens in the real world, and you have to deal with it. Um, so in event searching, this means that basically you can look at what is happening and decide um, to start a new interaction that reacts to that change, which is really powerful. How many here have, have, uh, are using the ORM, Doctrine ORM? Right. How many have listeners on entities? Yeah, why? <laughs> okay, you don't do it that way. This is a much, much better approach. So, the point is that after things happen, you want to take what happened and start a new interaction. And this is where I really like the CQRS with the command bus approach, which is basically taking care of this part of the application. So you have an event, something happens, now you want something to happen, therefore you fire a new command. We will see that a bit more in detail in a bit. Um, and the thing is that CQRS on the other side has a nice architecture when you implement it with a command bus in which you can retry interactions, which is really powerful. It allows you to basically fix these problems like the one with Stripe, Bitbucket, or whatever you're talking to, in which you can have a failure that you didn't plan for. So, it gets the job done once it's told to, be, um, to, to have a job to do. The other thing that the entire system of event sourcing and CQRS comes with is that this guy, this Alberto Brandolini guy, is another Italian crazy person, um, came up with this very cool system for managing a domain. So you can make a meeting, you, know, you plan a meeting with developers, with some stakeholders, and a person that basically prevents them from punching each other, which is the enabler, it's usually me, um, you put them in a room, you give them enough food to survive for the day, maybe two days, you remove all the chairs, all the tables, everything, and you give them a lot of sticky notes. And on the sticky notes, they will write what happens in the system, in uh, the past tense. And what is nice about this approach is that when you plan it this way, and by the way, it's a bit more formalized, there are rules, it's not just random sticky notes, once you start planning it this way, the design of your system starts moving from what the system is to what the system does. Okay, so you see what happens in the system and what triggers these past events. So you basically fill up a wall of everything that can happen and you can also decide, okay, this part is important and this one we don't care, it's just a waste of money. Very, very powerful instead of having these giant entity relation diagrams. Anybody have like uh, MySQL Workbench, take the company database and then make it nice and shiny and print it out and put it on a giant wall in the, the room? I did that a couple times. Did it help? No, it, it mostly was like, I can't change anything ever. We're doomed. This is the end. <laughs> okay, this approach is much better. Um, because it allows you to design where the system is going. It also allows you to map external systems. You know where the risk is. Where are the interactions that can lead to problems? Uh, one big problem, for example, is not just what can fail, but what changes over time. The API of some external system is not going to stay there forever. So you have to plan in such a way that you are going to maintain it for five years, then when they change it, you know that you have to rewrite it. And you can't have that one external system as the base of everything you do, because otherwise, if they shut down, you shut down as well. So it's very good, not just for software, but for understanding business risk. Um, you can map things that happen that have nothing to do with your software. Not everything that happens in your software is because the user clicked on a button. Things can happen in other systems, so you know of other events that happen. One good example there is the uh, warehouse system. Anybody doing e-commerce? Right? 
So one typical problem in e-commerce for junior developers is that they are constantly fixated with this idea that in a shopping cart, you can only have a product if nobody else has that product in a shopping cart. Or at least the availability must be consistent at all times. And I can tell you this is complete bullshit. Why? Because the warehouse may be on fire. Nobody knows what is happening. Yeah? Maybe somebody ordered a television and people in the warehouse dropped it. So what they do in the warehouse is every six months, they do this process called the inventory. And they discover that half the staff was stealing from the inventory. Okay? <laughs> Happens every time. Maybe I'm just too Italian for that, but anyway. So the other thing that happens is that you see the sequence in time of what is happening. So you can decide what can happen before, what can happen after, what are the preconditions for something to happen, which is going to allow you to design better business constraints. So that is the cool part. This is what allows you to basically have a much better interaction with business. The point is becoming more integrated with what your business does instead of being just like the code monkey. Okay, so you are now also helping doing the business decisions. Um, now, this diagram, this thing here that I've shown you, you can basically take it and transpose it into code. So let's start from the ugly part. The ugly part is the code because it's probably PHP. Um, but anyway, so we start from the important bit of the system. The, much, the, the most important part of the system is events, and an event looks pretty much like this. This is terrible to read. I can, re I can imagine that. Oh my god, this is so, so white there. So anyway, focus just on the highlighted rows. So you have a class, pull request provided. As you can see, it's a very simple name. It's a verb to the past. So it's saying that something happened. This class has some identifiers, some state. It is immutable, so you basically just take it. Once you create it, you never modify it, ever. Forget about modifying it. If you modify this, you broke everything. It has more state, so basically this is information, contextual information, and so on. That's it, that's an event, the end. There's nothing else to it. So it's something to the past, we gave it a name, we put some information in it, the end. The event is fired from somewhere. So this happened somewhere. Where does this happen? Usually it happens in the business logic. So it can happen either in the business logic or in an external system that you'd have no control upon. So the event is usually fired in something called the aggregate route. Who is familiar with DDD terminology? OK. so. The aggregate route, for those that are not familiar with it, is basically a wall between your application and your business logic. It is a set of information about a subject, like a user or a product or a shopping cart. These are good examples for an aggregate route. And you can interact with it. It will not respond. You can just tell it to do things. That's what an aggregate route looks like. So. An aggregate root, for those that are familiar with ORMs, is much like the entity that is subject in your interactions. So, in this case, I have my code review. Let me see if I can make this a bit bigger at least. Yay, not so much. No, 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 no. Don't write your slides with React.js. Terrible, terrible idea. So. Um, I'm violating some things here uh, from the DDD concepts because I'm extending from a thing called aggregate root, which Alexander there wrote. It's his fault. Um, it has an identifier, so it is effectively an entity. It doesn't need to have an identifier all the time, but generally it has one. It has some state. What is important about this state is that this state is transient. Transient means it's not saved. This state is not saved to a database table. This state changes over time. It has lots of state in this case. This is a bad design, uh, piece of design by me, but it works, so whatever. Huh? Do as I say, don't do as I do. Um, you construct it from some events. That's the interesting part. 
So when you construct it, you retrieve a new instance of this thing, and you will pass it a set of events, and it will loop over the events, right? And it will version them. So it will just loop over all the events here. Jeez, no, that was a bad idea, looking into the laser. Um, can't see anything. All right, so it will version them, so you have incremental events. They stuck. So this is the entire history of this thing that is growing on time, in time, and you can replay them. So it will replay each event, and this is what is going to move the state of your aggregate. Every time you have an event, you move from one state to the next one. And this will produce these state mutations on the fields that I defined up here. So these change depending on this replay. Um, so the replay, effectively, all it does is like, if an event is an instance of this, then set this state. If an event is an instance of that, set this state, and blah, 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 and so on. Okay? That's how it looks like. Um, from the outside, you don't see that there are these events. You, they, you don't care. These events are not visible from the outside. Um, they are recorded inside. So once you did something with the aggregate, you can ask it, give me everything you have recorded. Okay? I skipped over the implementation here. Just, it will get you everything it has. But otherwise, it looks like a normal entity. There is no difference between using this and like doctrine stuff and so on. What we can do is we can create it. Uh, here we have a name constructor. This is for starting a code review, so I'm public uh, static function start. What is interesting about this is that there at line 186, um, I'm actually not setting some initial state. I'm creating an event and I'm recording it. And when I record this event, it will also move the internal state. Because I'm now recording the event, this will increase the version, it will push to the recorded events, and it will apply any mutations that come from this event. There we go. That's what an aggregate is. Right. So, from the outside, it looks like a typical entity. There's nothing weird going on. You don't really see what is inside. You don't care. Um, by the way, if you're using getter setter entities, stop. Don't use getter setter approach. It's just like suicide. Um, on the inside, this thing is effectively just a stack. You're just pushing on top of the stack, you never remove, you know, and that's it. It's an append-only stack inside. So, from the outside and from, it effect, from its behavior, all it does is it is effectively a state machine. Anybody remember this stuff from university or something like that? Right? Okay, so what you have to imagine is that every arrow, every movement is a method call on the aggregate, and if the method call succeeds, then you are going to move to the next state. And the movement will be recorded as an event. That is what an aggregate root in the proof system in event sourcing looks like. So it's relatively simple, except that then you end up with some garbage like this. But that's how it is. That's your business. So who calls the aggregate? The aggregate, as I said, is the layer between your application and your domain. What happens is that generally we have the application layer doing that. Specifically, this will be some sort of command handler. Internally, it looks like this. So you have the code review. You fetch it from some repository. right? You just do a find operation. Then you do something on the code review. And after that, you store the code review. The end. There is nothing different from the typical um, ORM approach. Even active record looks like this. Except that is generally wrong. <clears throat> okay. So all this stuff generally happens in a command handler. The only reason we do that is just that we have a nice endpoint where we wrap this up. So in this case, we have a command handler called handle request code review. It receives some dependencies. In this case, it receives just the code reviews repository, which allows us to just apply some minimal dependence injection if we want to test stuff, if we want to swap it out. Um, and then it will receive a command, this request code review command, 
What is nice about this one is that this verb is now to the imperative. So we talked about a verb to the past tense before for events. This one is to the imperative. And then it will effectively just run the logic. In this case, we start the code review with some parameters coming from the command, and then we store the thing. The end. Looks simple? Confused? Seems good. All right. What happens is that then your events will be taken by this repository thing. It will be ex they will be extracted from the aggregate, and they will be pushed to this thing, which is called the event stream. Event store, event stream, depends on which side you're looking at it, uh, uh, at it from. Um, but you basically can imagine that this is a giant table of all the events that happen in your application. And at the end, you have just a listener that just watches for new events coming in. And when new events happen, you're just going to react. If you're familiar with the Symfony event listener or Zen Framework event listener, that's pretty much it. New events come in, you're going to receive them in this listener. So you can also loop through the entire history of what happened, not just of one aggregate, but of the entire application. So everything that happened in your application since the beginning of times, um, you can loop through it. Um, it is also immutable. We talked about it. It's an append-only data structure. So anything that is in the past, you can trust. This has some nice implications, because if you can trust past information without having to look back at it again, then you can cache it. Anything that happened yesterday, you know it didn't change. So you can just take the information as you read it last time and cache it in memory or whatever you want. So this means that we can create a new concept called the projector. The projector is effectively a function that is going to look at the history of your application and create state out of this history. So it will look at everything that happened to, I don't know, um, a e-commerce product and update the web page for that e-commerce product with all the images as they are to the latest known state. That's what the projector is. So it takes events and produces state. And generally what you do is you take some events and just dump them into a database. Why? Because reading the event stream is very annoying and very complicated whereas we are used to reading from databases, doing our join operations, you know, just reporting the usual boring stuff. So let's record the fact that a new pull request was added to our database. So register new reviews in status as table. This is, as you can see, just a class, nothing particular. It doesn't even implement an interface because I use this thing down here, I use this invoke signature. So what we want to do is that when a new review is created, a new re review comes in, then we are going to take the database. So we receive the database in the constructor down here. And we are going to just perform an update operation. So when a pull request is provided, we are going to insert into the review statuses with a bunch of information. OK? That's what a projector looks like. This is a very brutal, simple version. It has a lot of defects, but I think Alexander will talk about it later. Um, because in proof v7, uh, version 7, it looks a bit better than this. Um, OK, so we have projectors, we have aggregates, we have uh, command handlers. The other bit that is missing is this thing called the process manager. What is a process manager? A process manager is exactly like an event listener, except that we don't use the term event listener. Why? Because pretty much every framework uses event listener in the naming, which means that you may confuse it. A process manager is about the business process, not a technical event. Something happened in an application, therefore something needs to happen next. So it will take events and produce new commands. If this, then that. If this happened, then request a payment. If this thing happened, then send an email, and so on and so forth. OK? Takes events, first command. This is at least the approach that I use. There are better approaches as well, but this one works. So we are going to analyze incoming pull requests. So this means that when a pull request comes in, 
we are going to analyze it. In order to analyze it, we need the command bus, which is our gateway to letting our system do stuff. So this is where we push stuff when we need it um, to be processed. When we receive an event pull request provided, so somebody sent us a pull request, then we are going to start analyzing the pull request. So this is a command that we just fired to the command bus. That's all there is, okay? Relatively simple. Okay, one very clear distinction between projectors and listeners. A projector, you can rerun it as many times as you want. A listener, you can't, because otherwise you will look at the history of your application and resend all the emails that you did already send. You don't want that to happen, okay? Or maybe request all the payments again. Maybe somebody will pay, you know? It's good money. So to recap, um, so effectively we have some front end somewhere. The front end will tell the command bus to do the thing. Do the thing is the command, okay? This do the thing on the other side will have a, a command handler. The command handler is a function that receives the current event stream, which means all the history that you have in the past. It will receive some external services. You decide which they are, for example, a payment gateway, an email sending system, and so on and so forth. And it will load your aggregate from the event stream, given the identifier. The identifier is usually in the command. It will do something on the aggregate, and then it will extract the new events from the aggregate and put them in your event stream. Okay. Um, somewhere else, could be a separate process, separate server, doesn't matter. You have a, a system that will loop through new things that happen, and it will run all the projectors and all the listeners for newly raised events. Okay, let's look at some Haskell definition of it. Anybody familiar with Haskell? Yeah, okay. So effectively, we have, when we execute a command, we have a list of events up here. This pointer is rubbish, Stefan. <laughs> so we have a list of events, we receive a command, and we have the world to interact with, okay? And this will give us, eventually, this means eventually, this means that it can fail, this will give us another list of events. This, is, this means I'm going to produce new history. Handling an event is effectively when events come in, produce new commands. This is the if this, then that part. And the produce state generally takes events and dumps them into a cache, into a database, somewhere else. So the nice thing about this representation is that where you see this I.O. thing, this means that it can crash. So you know exactly where your system can crash and where the developer did a boo-boo, you know? Okay. There's another approach to this, which is completely different, which is to have the execute command not failing at all. You see, there's no I.O. in the first line there. So you get a list of events, you get a command, and you get a new list of events. And there is, on the other side, handle event will receive a list of events. It will receive the world, which means external API stuff, and it will produce eventually a new list of events. A good example of this is on a payment gateway. Instead of requesting a payment, you're receiving a new event, which is payment requested. And when you receive this event, you do an API call to the payment gateway. When the API gateway responds, you produce a new event, which says payment succeeded or payment failed. So it's a completely different way of seeing it. It has nothing to do with what I've shown you so far. But you see, we're just moving this I.O. thing. We're deciding on which side it is. So we decide how to deal with failures. So other things we can do with this. We can finally graph our entire domain. So it looks like this. Um, yeah, I'm rubbish at graphs. Um, so this is basically all the commands, all the events. This is rubbish. OK, let, let's, let's make it a bit better. 
You can now print out everything that happens in your application. Don't worry, it's unreadable, also on my screen. Um, and basically, when somebody in business says, oh, the system crashed, you can just point at where it crashed, and they will know exactly where to look at, because this is a business process. They know what this is about. All right. So other things we can do, we can create a git commit graph. For example, every time we have a command, we have a git checkout of a new branch. Every time we have an event, we have a commit, because something happened in the history of our application. Every time we have a success in the operation, we merge the branch back into master. Um, yeah, and if you print this out, you can see your application, how it's working. It's kind of freaky. I did that before with a projector. You can write a projector that does this. It takes the history of all commands and events, generates this, and it's kind of cool to see. You know exactly which commands failed and which not, except that you end up with a Git repository that is a few gigabytes in a few days. So now to the bad bits. OK, first of all, Designing with this pattern means that every time you have a new business interaction, you have to, first of all, design the aggregate method, which is your domain logic. You have to do this anyway. Don't put your domain logic in controllers. I will cut your hands. Um, you have to design the domain events, which is what is being raised. And this is very, very critical. You cannot forget the information in here. We'll see that in a second. But this is final. Once you design it, you can never change this class, this definition, never, ever. Um, you have to design the command, which is usually the translation of the HTTP request that comes in with all the necessary information to process the command. Um, you have to design the command handler, which is generally glue code. Um, it looks the same most of the time. So if you have good ideas on how to abstract it away, if you work with event sourcing, let me know. I'm interested in getting rid of this thing. And uh, you have to write the projectors, which means you have to write a lot of functions that take events and produce state. Uh, this is something that a lot of DBAs will love. Because you just give them a table and say, yeah, you know, like do your SQL magic and give me a table with this information, given this table. And they will love it because this is a challenge. And they can do it much more efficiently than what we do with our tools in PHP or programming languages, because they do it directly in the database. So we have to design also the schema changes for the projections and so on and so forth. Um, projections are not necessarily just database. You could just make an HTTP resource the projection and directly write to a file. You have to write the related listeners. And the related listeners are the next things that happen once this is done. This is nice. This step is nice because this is the cut between one feature and the next feature, which means that you can make user stories much smaller. So there's no confused boundaries now between what is one feature, what is the next one. This really, really helps on that side. There is no more like, oh, yeah, we also need to do that. No, that's a new story, right? a new scenario write a new set of these six things, right? OK. So the problem here is this is really, really hard to explain to developers at the beginning. And you need to see the code and write it for a full day before you understand what is going on, because there's a lot of moving parts, and you can do a lot of mistakes. On the other side, this is much, much better than what we are used to, which is the ORM-ish approach where everything changes and nothing changes and nobody has an idea of what is going on. How many here have an audit log for every database change? Really? Nobody has an audit log for the database. OK, fair enough. I guess I'm an outlier here. I have to implement it on every project after six months because nobody understands what is going on anymore. Um, other things that happen is since your commands go to this command bus, and this command bus is responsible for retrying operations, and this happens asynchronously, you now have to reason about command buses and message queues everywhere, which means that everything is asynchronous, which is a lot of problems for front-end people 
and generally also for you, because you can have race conditions. You have to think about what can happen in these asynchronous problems. Um, the other thing is, though, this scales really, really well. So you push the command in, and your front end says, OK, I got it. And you say 201 or 202, I don't remember that. But you just say, I got it. I'll deal with it. And that's it. So your front end will be your typical 10 to 20 milliseconds, maybe 50 if you have a giant framework. Depends. So you can retry the commands. So you push them to the queue. They fail. They go to the dead letter exchange. And you extract them from there, and you retry. And you can decide when to retry, when to not retry. Um, things we did wrong, we mixed up a lot of domain and uh, application logic. A few things that are important, in my opinion, is that commands are part of the domain. It is business terminology. When you say, do the thing, this is something that comes from business. It was not invented by a developer. Okay? When you say, send an email, this was told by business requirements, not by a developer inventing it. Um, process managers are also part of the domain. When this happens, then that happens. That is the rule that the business set. What is not in the domain, for example, are the projectors. Projectors are just garbage code that is copying from one data structure into another data structure. There is nothing going on there. There's no business. This is just copying data around. So it's more of a technicality. Um, other things that you can do wrong. Making fat events. The problem with fat events, which is an event with a lot of fields, uh, is that if an event is too fat, you cannot change it that easily. The more state you have in something, the easier it is that you will have to mutate how that state is stored. And the problem is that the events are persisted, and they're forever. You cannot change them. You cannot change the structure of the past. If you change the structure of an event, then the meaning of past events of that type changes. There is an entire book about this from Greg Young. He is writing a versioning in an event source system, um, which is, I think, already 50, 60 pages, just on this topic. So don't go that way. Make them tiny events. A good example is like the record preferences. You have a page with 50 preferences in it. Instead of making a one event which is called record preferences, make a lot of tiny events, each with their own preference. This is also good because you can also record when people checked or unchecked something very, very specific without going crazy. So you just make small events, one per preference. That's a good way of doing it. On the other side, you can see that this can explode in a lot of complexity. So it's not necessarily the good way of going. So, all right, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm going to skip on the rest here. Um, so, other things that you should really avoid is executing any business logic outside the aggregates. The aggregates are the part of your application that decides from where to where you can go and where you cannot go. And you should never really ask them anything. They should be um, just a black box. So they guarantee consistency, but they will not tell you what the current state is. You can just tell them what to do next, and that's it. So it will just throw an exception if something cannot be done, or produce events as the output. You don't ask it, where am I right now? You just tell it, go to this place next, and it will say no. You cannot, or yes, and here's what happened. So it will give you just the events as a result of the operation. All right. Um, let me just skip over. I got way too little time for this, sorry. So this is a lot of new technology, a lot of new paradigms. If you want to approach this, I suggest you to not go with the, I'm going to mix Cassandra and you know this technology and Node.js here and Kafka and so on. No, just use boring technology. Personally, until I'm going to make a shitload of money, I'm going to use Postgres and only Postgres. There was a good talk about Postgres, I think, here before. Was it good? No. All right. So I use it also as a queue. Because if I have enough throughput to uh, trash my queue with events, that means that I'm making a shitload of money. 
if I have a shitload of money, I'm going to hire a data engineer and not do this stuff my own. Okay. So, right. Ah, the last bit here. And sorry for skipping so much. Please look at this. It's a nice technology, but don't take it as a silver bullet. Please make sure your domain is process oriented before you try to use this approach to design a system. So please do not use event sourcing for a system that is not fit for it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Ah, all right. Hello. Uh, last time I tried to implement an event sourcing uh, system for my domain, I failed at the event sequence. I actually had no idea how to replay the right events for my state I want to reach. So. Mm -hmm. Can you link events, or it's singly uh, depending on the timestamp? The, okay, so this is solved in proof, for example. What can happen is that you can have events happening concurrently, but you still have versions about events. Okay, the moment at which the event was raised, which is the moment at the time in the application, not in the database, that you can use in order to replay state for projections, but inside the aggregate, you usually use the event version because the aggregate is responsible for also generating that version, which means the aggregate made the decision that this one is the next event. In proof specifically, this is uh, done via optimistic locking, which means that if two aggregates try to perform the same interaction at the same time and they have the same ID, then one of the two will fail. This is what happens in this one. And this is a fairly acceptable limitation in my opinion. If you have high concurrency, then you need to design this upfront before starting to code. What can happen if two people do this at the same time and we accept each interaction? In that case, what can happen is that you can have uh, more complex problems about transactionality. You have to take on how to deal with conflicts. And this is a bit more complicated. This is usually called a saga. And the idea is that you have to roll back state by producing new events. Since you cannot go back, you have to produce new events that compensate. A good example of this is a booking system, a hotel. The hotel books rooms, and then you have overbooking because two people clicked at the same exact time from two different systems, or maybe uh, two different brokers booked something, you know, and they're now telling you after a day that they booked it for you. And now you have two reservations, and you have to decide to which customer tell that they're not going to get the reservation. So this is on you. Either you pass it to the support team, and the support team can manually raise events to revert stuff. So they actually work around the aggregate in which they become the business logic. So it's a human taking the decision. Or you have an automated system that cancels reservations that are double. Make sense? Yeah, kind of. Uh, I still don't know um, which event to take for my specific uh, instance of a model. So okay, f for, for the aggregate itself, I would suggest just use the versioning approach okay. and prevent double inserts by just having a, a unique key on that, which is sufficient for most scenarios. Um, if you have concurrency problems in which you like go milliseconds, in which you have inserts in the incorrect order for some reason, then that is more to be analyzed at the domain level. This is common in finance where you have like millisecond transaction times in order to you know, earn some money by basically stealing in a legalized way. That's how banks work, you know. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Any other questions? Well? No. German also, okay. Yeah, there's one here. Yeah, okay. So you can, okay, saving state. State, um, the aggregate is basically replayed from history. 
But if you have very large aggregates, such as a thing that changes a thousand times a day, after a year you have 360,000 records just for one object, you're not going to replay that in memory all the time. So in that scenario, you use something called the snapshotting system, which is just a cache. So it will just replay until 360,000, and then it will see, oh, I got another 5,000. So next time, I'm going to start from this state and replay just the last 5,000. Um, this is a property that you can use because since the past history is immutable, the fold operation, which is a functional operation on the list of, of data that you received, you can just start it from the last known state and continue from there. Okay. I just use normal Postgres transactions for the inserts. Yes, so basically every time I start a command, I always open a transaction, and when the command finishes, I either commit or roll back. That's how I do it. It has some faults, but it still has advantages because honestly, transactions are very, very stable. So I was just using that. And they fix the problem with the concurrency if you use optimistic locking because you revert all the events that happen in a certain interaction if the identifiers provide. Right? Okay. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to make it kind of like uh, use some uh, message queue, like Reddit, for the events coming, and then uh, to like do it in parallel. Uh, no, okay. So the events, when they come in, they go persistent first. They don't go anywhere until they're saved. First, you save them. So if you look at the event store, uh, you can make a pointer and you say, I got here last time I looked at the event store. Everything else is inserted, but you first persist them. They need to be persisted on a disk. You never want to lose them ever. So this is very vital. From there, you can say, OK, I'm going to take them and push them to a queue, and somebody else will process them, but only after persistence. I'd like to have uh, many more birds, uh, taking the events from the queue. And, uh, no, the, the events they need to go to the persistence first. There is a. Thing, but everything happens then is just. Yes. You, you consider to divide it. Yes. Once you have it, you can distribute it like publish and subscribe approach. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Ah, yes, I came for this. Yes. <laughs>